Hey, what's going on everyone? So in one of the earlier videos, I went through how to use Ansible to manage your EC2 instances in AWS. And we set it up in such a way that you could use dynamic inventory and target the specific EC2 instances based on a particular tag you were interested in. So I thought in this video, it would be kind of cool to expand on that and create a role and a playbook that gives us um, a little bit more functionality and also lets you see how Ansible roles and playbooks all tie into part of the larger configuration management scenario. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to create a role that allows us to create user accounts on an EC2 instance and add an SSH private key for that user account to enable SSH access to that system. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to create a list of our users from the dev team, the members of the dev team with their SSH public keys. And then we're going to create an Ansible role that goes and creates those user accounts on all the servers in AWS where the environment is tagged as dev, which the end result of that is it gives all of our developers access to any machine in development. So that's kind of a, long story or a short story made long, something like that. Let's jump into the code. Okay, so starting off here, we've got this subfolder called roles. Inside of that, I created the role that I'm wanting, wanting to create here called dev team. And now Ansible convention says that we have a tasks folder inside of that, which is where the action happens. And then the first or the default task is called main, which in our little simple example here is the only one we need. Seems like a lot of work, but it really does make sense when you start writing larger and more complex roles. So now a role or a task contains um, a bunch of different parameters, name of the task, basically what's it doing. And then you can do some Ansible defined types. Right. So like we're creating a user account, which is a known object in Ansible. It has certain parameters such as name, user ID or UID, the comment, the shell. And then we're going to use state as well to determine whether that user account should be um, present or absent or removed. I think is the right word. So now you can see the values for these things are a bunch of Jinja templates and it pulls in looking for an item with a key of username, a key of UID, and so on. And it does that by using this with items command to iterate over a thing called dev team. All right, I'll show you that dev team in just a minute. Let's finish out this file first. We're gonna create the authorized keys file. So creating an authorized key for this user, and here's the key itself or where the key will be supplied whenever this template gets filled out. And again, doing that same with items iteration. And then finally, we're going to give the user sudo um, rights on that box, but there's a condition to that. So the condition is the item.type is defined and the item type has to be set to admin and the user state or the item state has to be set as present. So if all of those are true, then the user gets sudo rights on the box. And we do that by using the copy command and we copy basically this templated string into a file in the sudoers.d directory and then specify the mode, the owner, and the group permissions for that file. So we've seen a lot where we're iterating over this dev team item. So let's go take a look at what that is. And inside of our group vars folder, we have a folder called all with an item called dev team in there. Now that dev team is an array of items that spells out all of those parameters that we used in this template over here. So we've got the username defined, the UID, the full name, all the way down to the key itself, which is the public key for my SSH key. Now, as our dev team grows, all we have to do is add another value under here, you know, username Bob, UID, 5002, so on and so forth. And we can just continue adding this and have our dev team fully defined, right? So we've got our role that gets populated by our dev team values. 
The last thing we do is create the playbook itself that executes all of that. So again, a playbook is a list of tasks and a task has a name. In this case, it's the name is add dev team users to the EC2 instances in dev. Again, that's very specific, very clear about what it's going to do. No ambiguity. And then here comes the magic part that you saw in the last video. If you watched that video, the hosts here is set to this value tag env dev. So what that's going to do is it's going to look through your entire AWS infrastructure at all the EC2 instances, looking at the tags on those instances, and it's going to look for a tag named env. And if it finds a tag named env, if the value for that tag is dev, D-E-V, then that host is going to be targeted by this playbook. Whenever it executes its commands on here, we've got become true, which basically tells Ansible you're going to have to use sudo permissions to execute the tasks that we're giving you here. And the tasks themselves that we're giving it is done by specifying a list of roles. So we're specifying the dev team role here, which refers to this first file that I showed you here for adding the user accounts. Now, this is where you start seeing the flexibility and the power of Ansible because I can have a bunch of different roles. I've got our dev team role here. I could have a role for a web server that installs Nginx, a database role that installs MySQL or Postgres, you know, and the possibilities are endless. And so rather than specifying those individual installation tasks for every single server, I just write them once as a role, and then I just apply that role to the group of instances that it fits to. So I get this massive reusability in all of my Ansible configuration. But I know what you're thinking, cool story, bro, but does it work, right? So I'm gonna pop open a terminal here. And remember, because we're using Python virtual environments, the first thing we have to do is activate our virtual environment spelling it correctly because spelling counts. All right, so now our virtual environment is activated. I can give it the Ansible playbook command. I need to tell it who's got the inventory. So use the dash I flag and then specify my inventory file. Now I've also got to tell it who I want to use as my user account because I'm not logging in as myself, which would be Will Button is my username here. I'm logging in instead as an EC2 user. Also, I have a bunch of SSH keys on my um, laptop here, so I can't rely on the default SSH key, so I've got to tell it which SSH key I'm using. So I'll give it the path to my SSH private key, and then finally, we'll give it the name of the Ansible playbook we want to run, which is Dev Teams Users. We'll smash the enter key. And through the magic of time warp on the internet, we sped up through that. But what you get to see here in the final results is okay for four stations or four instances, because I had four EC2 instances deployed in this AWS account. Changed was zero, which means that I obviously ran this playbook before recording a video so that I knew it was going to work. My bad. And then the rest of these here, you can see unreachable, failed, skipped, reused and ignore or rescued and ignored. But basically you get a summary of all the systems that this uh, Ansible playbook reached out, contacted and the end result of that change. So now there's probably other ways to manage SSH access to your EC2 instances. But here's why I do it this way, because there's a uh, saying of, killing two birds with one stone. And in this particular instance, we're killing the whole damn flock, right? Because here's what's going to happen. We're going to put this playbook in a GitHub repo. And whenever we onboard a new developer, we hire a new developer. I'm going to walk up to him and I'm going to say, hey, if you want access to development, give yourself access to this repo. And so that's going to work for a couple of things. They're going to go to GitHub. They're going to check out this repo. Uh, they're going to find the user account in there or find the group VARs or where they add their details. I usually help them with that. You know, I'm not trying to leave them high and dry here, but they are going to have to create 
a branch because they don't have push rights to the master branch. They're going to have to make the change to it. They're going to have to edit the YAML file and then open up a pull request. And so let's look at all of the things I learned about working with this person from this one task. I know that they can get to GitHub. I know that they know how to create a branch. I know that they know how to edit YAML files. I know that they know how to open up a pull request. Um, I know that they know what their SSH public key is because they've actually got to enter it in here. After they reach that level, all I have to do is merge the pull request, deploy this change. And by the time they get through all of that, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with them having SSH access to the servers in the dev environment. So that's why I like this format so much. Um, it's very, very conversational. It's very interactive. It's a way for developers to start taking ownership of accessing and managing the resources they need, but do so in a documented, controlled GitOps style environment or workflow. So um, I hope that was helpful for you. Hope you enjoyed the video. And um, yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you all in the next video. 